All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation for Thursday, September 30th, 2021. Thanks for joining us today. If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I come here every afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to architects. It doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. You may have circled a date on the calendar and said 2021 is my year, and you may be on the runway to starting your own thing, or you may have owned your own firm for a year or 10 years or 26 years, and you've started to rethink or even reimagine what your firm could or should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of small firm architects just like you. So thanks for joining us today. Say hi as you get here. Let us know where you are. It is fun to see where in the world everybody is coming in from. Um, we do on a regular basis spread this conversation from the East Coast to the West Coast of the United States and start jumping oceans to our friends in the UK and Africa and uh, many times around to the Philippines and Australia and New Zealand as well. So let us know where you are. Of course, I'm joined today by my co-host, Catherine, how are you? Hi, Jeff. I'm doing great. You know what I love about this is that some days it's like everybody's just leaning against the door and we open it up and they just fall in. There's a whole bunch of people that fall in all together. That's why I feel like there are definitely people just, falling in the door right just now. Waiting, <laughs> waiting against the door to get in. Yep. yep. That's that's a really good analogy. There are. It does seem like people are falling in right now, which is awesome. Glad to have you all here. Uh, some of you are showing up on Facebook. I like I see Rebecca McKinney. Hi, Rebecca. And some of you are showing up on LinkedIn. Hey, Randy Wilburn, great to have you uh, joining us today, a former uh, Context Clarity Live guest himself. Glad that you're here. Some of you are showing up as Facebook user. The reason that happens is because you're inside a closed Facebook group. Facebook has privacy policies, which we respect. Um, That information, your information, your picture, your name cannot go out to the rest of us unless you give Facebook permission to speak with Restream, which is the platform that we use. So if you'd like to show up as something other than Facebook user, go to the URL that's in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen right now. It's chat.restream.io slash FB, as in Facebook. And you too can show up as yourself. See some friends over on Twitch as well. I don't think I've seen anybody from uh, YouTube yet. But I'm sure we'll have some folks joining from YouTube as well. I see Kurt over there on, on Twitch. And um, <laughs> lots, of, lots of friends. Yoko's over on Twitch. Hi, Yoko. Uh, Scott, welcome back from San Francisco. Isra. <laughs> Isra wants to know if there's a crocheted bathtub today. So let me, let me scroll down and see who the uh, first name that I saw coming in was Hans. So Hans over in Portland, Maine. You, sir win the crocheted bathtub for today for being the first in to our conversation today. So uh, right now I see Barry, he's over there in Scotland. Good evening, Barry, to you. And um, he's leading the charge right now for furthest virtual travel. So we'll see how far uh, far the conversation spreads and who else comes into conversation with us. All right, Catherine, we've got a big day today. We've got a great guest uh, backstage enjoying the green M&Ms back there. I know. And, I'm so um, excited for this. I'm really, really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. <laughs> I, I see it back there eating them up. He's eating he's them, eating them up, by the okay. handful. So. It's okay. He's, <laughs> he's That's what they're there for. It is. It is. Hello from Russia, which I think means, is, means uh, Olga has joined us. Hi, Olga. Thanks for joining us. I think you're further away than Barry. So right now you are leading uh, leading the charge for furthest virtually traveled. Mm. All right. I, I, I know I say this a lot, but one, at one point I was the farthest away. At one point I used at to win that. You were. At one point you were. You know what? Everyone. <laughs> yeah, there. So um, you are all, as you're joining us, you're all part of the Context and Clarity community. And community is going to be a big part of what we discussed today with our special guest. And it still amazes me every single day that we started this back at the beginning of April 2020. And here we are, right? It's because of all of you. It's because of this community that this thing has kept going, that context and clarity has become a thing, and that we're able to invite the guests like our guests that we have today to context and clarity live. So first of all, thank you. 
for all of you for that. And second of all, I hope that you really enjoy our guest today and our conversation that we're about to have. So uh, what, have I, what have I forgotten? It feels like there's some, uh, maybe some housekeeping items that I've left off today. Anything? Maybe not. All right. Well, let's just get into it then. Um, I see uh, Mark LePage. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Mark says he's looking forward to to uh, hanging out with Pat for an hour. So th- those of you that are curious, Mark LePage is joining us. Obviously, he is the uh, host of the Entree Architect podcast, the founder of Entree Architect, Gable Media, and and more. Our, our guest today, I almost gave it away. You all know who it is already. But our guest today was on episode seven of the Entree Architect uh, podcast back in about 2012 or 13, I guess it was. I can't hear you, Catherine. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I am going to go ahead and, and introduce our guest today because we're really excited to, uh, to have that guest here. So our guest today is, uh, was trained. Our guest today was trained as an architect. He's an entrepreneur. He's a business builder an author and a podcast host. He's an advisor, an inspirer, and philanthropist. He's the founder of Smart Passive Income and probably the most recognizable passive income entrepreneur in the world. Pat Flynn, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. We're really happy to have you here. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Can I play a sound effect? Like, I just am so excited uh, to be here. Hello, everybody. It's good to see Mark in the chat. That was July 2013 that we connected on the Entre Architect podcast, and uh, that was a while back. So I'm excited to be back and be here with all of you live. This is an amazing setup. Well done, you guys. Well, thank you. Um, so so um, it, it has been a while, right? It's been a long time. And, you know, one of the things that I've been talking about all week as we have these conversations is that, that you have a story that I think will resonate with a lot of people um, in, in our audience. As you know, we have an audience of uh, a, a lot of, not, not strictly, but a lot of small firm architects here in the audience. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the folks in this audience have lived through some ups and downs in the economy, which is part of, uh, part of your story as well. So if, if I can tease it out by saying you usually start your story, the story, your origin story, if you will, with you had a dream job and then, you know, fast forward a bunch of years and now here you are, uh, as the founder of smart passive income, but how did this all start? Yeah. I mean, I graduated from Berkeley with a degree in architecture because that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I, I, I was fairly good at it and I was excited about it. And got a really good job out of the Bay Area in San Francisco. In fact, that job came as a result of a connection to the marching band at Cal. It was a result of a relationship I built there that I ended up landing my job. And all this worry about resumes and all this kind of stuff, it was actually a connection in the marching band that got me my dream job to work in the hospitality uh, sort of wing of a, of an architecture firm in the Bay Area where I could work on restaurants, where I could work on hotels, where I could work on some retail spaces as well. And it was so much fun. Uh, I was just thriving. You know, I had graduated and then uh, was doing everything I was supposed to do. I was contributing to my 401k. I was taking all these uh, exams that I didn't really have to, but I just wanted to because I wanted to just go to all the meetings and and, 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 and absorb as much of it as I could uh, in, in my young age, postgraduate. And so um, I ended up becoming the youngest person in the firm to become job captain, which was just unheard of because uh, that's a lot of responsibility and you start to have to own a, a team and manage a team at that point. And I was, I was just about to, to enter uh, that career um, full throttle until 2008 happened. And in 2008, my boss calls me into his office, sits me down, which he never did before. And he tells me that, you know, they kept me on as long as they could, but they had to let me go. And, in, and, and I don't know if you've ever like, fallen on a skateboard or rollerblades and just like got the wind knocked out of you. But that's what it felt like. It just, I couldn't breathe. It just was, that was my weird initial reaction. And then my, my next reaction was to go back to my desk and literally call every single engineering firm, MEP, like all of them to see if they had any spaces open. And I was uh, eventually at the point where I was begging and pleading just to get back in. Cause I, I had nowhere else to go. I didn't know anything else. I, this is what I dedicated my life to. And I'd done everything that I was supposed to do to get to this point. And yet some things still went wrong. 
Uh, and I remember coming back home and just being very confused, almost, you know, the whole wide range of emotions that come with something like that from anger to sad to what did I do wrong to I'm a failure to what are my parents going to think and all this kind of all these kinds of things. Uh, and it took a few weeks. In fact, one thing I did during that time that helped me escape the reality was actually I, I ended up watching Back to the Future uh, probably around 50 times around that time because I just hoped in my mind that maybe there was a way I could, uh, you know, find a DeLorean and go back into time and change things, right? But of course, every time after uh, one hour and 56 minutes, I'd come back to reality. Here I was uh, back again with, without a job or a job that was going to be terminated soon. Luckily, I was a job captain and I had some clients that they couldn't just let me go that day. But they gave me, you know, a month and a half to sort of try to figure something out. Uh, and, and I just really went down into a, a spiral. Uh, well, eventually I woke up because I realized that, no, I can't go back into time and change things. But like in the movie, the things I do now, the actions that I take, the decisions that I make now actually affect my story for the rest of my future. So am I going to just sit here and just cry about it the whole time or am I actually going to do something about it? So that's when I actually discovered a podcast called uh, Internet Business Mastery. And there were a whole bunch of other people teaching internet marketing, but these guys seemed to be real. They were genuine. They told great stories. And in fact, there was one person who I heard on their show. His name is Cornelius Fitchner. And he had a podcast. He was a guest on the show. And he was talking about how he was making money helping people pass the project management exam or the PM exam. And that just blew me away. Like he's just helping people pass an exam online and he's making six figures doing it. And then I went, wait a sec. Like I took a whole bunch of exams to get here to be an architect. And one of them, I remember there was like no information about it. It was the lead exam. Many of you know the lead exam, leadership and energy and environmental design. And I had my notes and I had like, I, 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 even when I was still working, I had built an online resource to help my coworkers. And that was it. Past the exam, it had nothing to do with it anymore. So I went back to that and magic happened. When I started to put more time into that, I started noticing people showing up because my website was showing up in Google. I started to become a resource. I got very involved in some architect forums, helping people with this particular exam, so much so that I actually became an authority in that space. I, I wasn't, I barely passed that exam, but because I was the person to step up and start talking about it and actually get up and help people, I started to become seen as an authority to a point where people just started asking me for more and more. And, and I eventually got to the point where I put all that knowledge about this exam into a, a Word document, essentially, it was 70 pages in a Word document converted into a PDF file that I sold on that website, uh, which was in the lead.com, which later changed to green exam academy, uh, academy.com uh, for $19 and 99 cents. Uh, and the same month I eventually got terminated, I launched that product and that $19 ebook sold uh, $7,908 and 55 cents worth of, of that book. And it was, it was, it was game changing. It was absolutely life changing. And my first reaction was obviously super excited. And I, I was making two and a half times more than I was when I was a job captain from a, a, a ebook that I just put together. It just blew my mind. But then I started to have feelings of like, is the FBI going to come and get me? Like, like this doesn't even seem real. It doesn't seem fair even like, do I even deserve this? Who am I to talk about this and share this? Like, should I be giving this away for free? Like what's going on? And I just started to have a lot of these things that were just internal mindset issues about this that 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 made me believe that maybe I wasn't supposed to be doing this. But you know what really changed things was the fact that I was getting emails. Eventually, emails started coming in from my customers who said, Pat, like you helped me finally pass this exam and you helped me get a raise. You helped me uh, get a career uh, change because of this. Uh, and they were calling me by name. And that had never happened before with anything I was doing in my career, right? As a senior drafter and then job captain, I, I I had a job to do and I did my job well, but I never really got recognition for it. And I, I have my fingerprint on so many buildings in this country, a lot of P.F. Chang's, in fact, um, and yard house restaurants, uh, but nobody will ever know. And I'll never get thanked for that. And here I am helping a little like per, uh, a tiny world of the lead exam specifically and getting crazy recognition for it um, to a point where I was getting fans People were like, I'm a huge fan of yours. Like, I'm just helping you pass an exam. Like, that's it. But I, I eventually knew because of the impact that that had on their lives, it was it meant so much more. Um, and then a lot of people said, Pat, how are you? How did you do this business thing? Like, what? how did you even you didn't go to business school or nothing? Like, how are you making this happen? So I built smartpassiveincome.com to just share everything. I shared how much 
I was selling, how much I was spending, what was working, what wasn't working, how I was doing it, and been doing that since 2008. And here we are 13 years later, and it's become this incredible business that allows me to, to help people in all aspects of life who want to build something a little bit more and get recognized for some of the amazing talents that they might have in this crazy world we call the internet. And, 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 and I'm very proud that I still continue to do it in a way where I can lead by example. And that's the difference between me and a lot of other people who teach this stuff is they'll, they'll talk a good talk. And in fact, I'm not a great salesperson. I'm not a great copywriter at all. But what helps me is just sh leading by example, um, by building something and showing people the ins and outs of it. And you know, sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't, but it's always a lesson. And it's always something I can help people with. So uh, fast forward to today, and here I am now live streaming with all of you and uh, still able to help make an impact in some way. And hopefully this inspires you because, you know, although the layoff was very difficult, uh, one of the most difficult things I've lived through, it actually became the best thing that ever happened to me um, because it opened up my eyes to these other things that I didn't even know was possible for me. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, <laughs> I know this sounds weird, but I think you know what I mean is I'm, I'm glad you were laid off because if not, you know, sort of the, the butterfly effect, what, where would we be now? We obviously we might not be having this conversation and everything that you've created since then, whether it's the YouTube videos or, you know, what, whatever, whatever the, the, parts and pieces of your franchise are, you know, we probably would not have available to us. So I'm, I'm glad that you've taken this journey that you have personally. Thank you. Thank um, you. you mentioned the, um, um, internet business mastery podcast. It was Jeremy and Jason, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Jeremy and, and, and Jason, although Jeremy used a, a pen name, uh, Sterling, Sterling and Jay, uh, internet business mastery. <laughs> yeah. If you remember, uh, man, yeah. those guys, I credit them so much, um, you know, and I'm just trying to pay it forward. Yeah, that, that was one of my, uh, one of the first podcasts that I started listening to back in the day. So <laughs> that really resonates with me. We, we start these conversations every day on Clubhouse, uh, on the Clubhouse app. So for those of you that are out there, whether you're listening on the, the uh, podcast version or you're here live with us. Um, if you're not familiar, Clubhouse is an audio-only social media app, I guess we could call it that. Uh, we start these conversations in live uh, audio conversations every morning. And uh, this morning, as we were previewing this conversation, uh, Caitlin Parker had a question. That I think I think it it goes directly to what you were um, what you were saying as you were describing, you know, and sort of am I worthy, right? Is mm -hmm. how do you get over imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome is a real thing. I'll tell you, it's, it's the idea that maybe we don't deserve the success that, that we're trying to set out for ourselves. Uh, and, and Caitlin, I appreciate this question. It's a very vulnerable question for sure. How do we get over it? Well, I think that we need to find truth. And oftentimes imposter syndrome comes from stories that we make up. Um, maybe stories that are made up in a certain way because of certain past experiences or because of what society says or other people say. Um, but I love taking a Elon Musk sort of first principles approach to things, right? Where we try to discover at the root, well, what's the truth? And, and, and if you're trying something for the first time and you're like, I can't do this, um, that's not true because you've never done it before, right? And, and it's just, that's the logical truth behind it. So when it comes to imposter syndrome, I think the first thing to do is help yourself by realizing that you can make an impact on a person and to, to try to make an impact on a person in the quickest way possible. This is why when people come to me and they're like, Pat, I want to create an online course. I'm going to sell it to thousands of people. I'm like, okay, well, find one person, help them through what it is you're going to teach. And not only are you going to understand exactly what you need to say to get a, a person to understand that you, you can serve them, not only are you going to understand what to put inside this thing that will eventually become a course but you will prove that you can actually get a result for somebody at which point everything unlocks for you and you are more able to promote this thing. You're more able to market it. So let's get one person, one result. And that can help with imposter syndrome because then it helps you figure out in a more safe manner, almost like a Petri dish where you can try something. And if it goes out of control, at least it was controlled in that Petri dish. You can experiment and then move it aside. And if you find a formula that works, boom, let's repeat it, take that pipette, put it all around and get more of it, right? And, so, and, 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 and that's, that's a great thing. I think another thing is we often can't see things. We, we can't read the label when we're inside the bottle. And oftentimes we're trying to do that and it's very difficult. 
So connecting with other people, and this is why I'm likely preaching to the choir here because you're all here and supporting each other in a community. And this is why I think community is huge and so massively important. But when you surround yourself with people who will lift you up, when you have people who will root for you, when you, like Jim Rohn says, surround yourself with people because you are the average of the five people you spend most of your time with, when you increase that average, uh, you are more likely to increase your own success. And the reason is because those people will tell you things that you need to, to, to hear. They will validate the things you're doing. They will make sure you're, you're, you're going and trekking down the right path. And so getting involved with other people, I would definitely not be where I'm at today if it weren't for the people I surrounded myself with. And e even if I had still remained an architect, I could always have said, I'm here because of a relationship that happened somewhere in the past. So if I could go back in time to use this sort of time motif here uh, and tell myself something at my earlier uh, uh, age and say, try to meet and befriend and serve and, and, and provide value to as many people as you can because you never know the next relationship you create, the next person that you help in some way, shape or form could absolutely be the answer to the thing that you've been looking for, or could know somebody who might have that answer or could give you an, uh, a tip that you just needed to hear or, or something. So, so people, right? People, people, people. I think that's how we get over imposter syndrome because a lot of these times if we're left to our own devices, we often um, bring ourselves down. I think that's I think that's so true. You know, you're talking about truths and you're talking about one person and and obviously um you know you you talk a lot about your your family. You talk a lot about uh you back to the future, the things, you know, that you you love and another question that came up this morning on Clubhouse was from uh, Shrio Shrioshi. I apologize. I know I I butchered your name every time I try to say it, but uh Shrioshi asked this morning about um, in a way, building, building your brand that's, that's authentically you. And I mean, that, that just, that just oozes from your pores, I think. So how do you, how do you go about doing that? And maybe you just answered that in, in the last, uh, last thing that you said. No, I mean, it's, it's a great question. I think that a lot of times when, especially creators, anybody who's publishing YouTube videos or creating podcasts or starting something like a new brand, um, it's very difficult to guess before you do what it is exactly that you're going to end up doing. And I think that experimentation comes into play. I think that iteration comes into play. And the realization that when you do something and you set out to try to do something or try to accomplish something, um, you either get the result you wanted or the lesson you needed. So therefore, there is no failure as long as you keep going. And that's how you eventually find your voice, how you find your place how you find your positioning, how you find your 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 what what it means to be you in the space that you're trying to get into. It's very difficult to guess what that's going to be. A lot of people try to guess. A lot of people create business plans. Here's how we differentiate ourselves versus others, and that's good to have a plan. But oftentimes, uh, people have a you know what does Mike Tyson say? Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I think yeah. is what they is what he says. So um, as long as you have the right intention then that intention to serve others becomes the direction you take. And you might go here, you might go there, but as long as that North Star is in place, combined with your own self and what you enjoy doing, uh, then, then, then you either, you, you know, you, there's no failure as long as you keep getting up and keep going. And then eventually, you know, I know more specifically, a lot of YouTubers say, yeah, I didn't even know what I was doing. I just, you know, it wasn't until I created my hundredth video that I finally felt like I was, in a rhythm and in a cadence that I, that, that was fully me. Um, I think that when you have some outside help or outside perspective, like we just mentioned, then that can happen perhaps a little sooner because other people are likely to do a better job of telling you what's unique about you than you uncovering that yourself. It's actually a big challenge to have a person tell you what their own superpower is. It's more likely another person on the outside is able to do that. Um, so again, connection, people. Right. But uh, I know a lot of podcasters who say it's not until often episode 20 to 30 that they go, oh, OK, well, I, now I'm kind of getting it and I feel like I'm, I'm sitting in my saddle finally. Um, and, and realizing that that's not going to happen up front is, is really key, because I think a lot of us, especially in this day and age where everything is on demand, we often want those results or want that understanding immediately. And I think the challenge is especially important for uh, people like myself who are perfectionists who, you know, got the good grades, who went to a good school and everything was perfect. I think, I think my layoff was the first big, like, whoa, being perfect is actually didn't even get me to where I wanted to go. It's, it's iteration, it's improvement and even incremental improvements over time 
for your for your business and for yourself. One percent improvement over time, as James Clear says in his book Atomic Habits, that over time exponentially grows to something huge. Um, we know this in finances, but it's also for personal development and the brand recognition you have in your company and the efficiency of your employees and, and all those kinds of things. So how do you, you mentioned perfectionist. How do you keep perfectionism from holding you back? That's a great question because it, it, it will hold you back. Uh, perfectionism, I've realized is just an excuse because I'm scared of something, right? I'm scared of looking bad in front of others. I'm scared of failing. I'm scared of the ramifications of that. But like I said earlier, the, the failing is good. Failing is a part of the process. Failing is learning. Failing is an acronym for first attempt in learning, as my school says, uh, my kid's school says. And, and, I, and I wholly agree with that. Um, but perfectionism can be tough and getting help from the outside can definitely help. But I think that perfectionism is something that can come over time. I think that when you realize that you get more value from getting to the next step and then assessing what happened, and maybe there were things that were maybe not as efficient as they could be or imperfect, well, let's try again and do it better the next time. And again, 1% improvement. And I think when you realize this, so imagine, imagine this scenario, your audience, your customers, your clients, uh, if we imagine that they are like the people who are in the ocean and they don't have a life vest, right? They need some help from us. They, they need support. They need some advice. They need our services or what have you. They're drowning. Imagine a person who you are serving as somebody who really needs your help. And they go to you and they say, help, throw the lifeline. And you go, oh, I don't know. I've never done it before. Or ah, I don't know if I can make the perfect throw for you right now. I mean, you would never say that. You would go and help them and do whatever it takes to hopefully help them. Um, and so in that way, your perfectionism is a very selfish approach to what actually matters, which is the service to others, right? And so that analogy there often gets people to go, yeah, well, I would never do that. Well, you're doing that by saying your perfectionism is more important than you putting yourself out there, potentially failing to help others. Uh, that's amazing. Y you've obviously come a long way, evolved a lot since the green exam Academy, you know, the, the, your notes from the, uh, studying for the lead exam. So your, your platform has expanded. Obviously you've got smart passive income.com, but, but you know, any of you that are out there listening or, or watching live now go to smart passive income.com and you'll see all the, all the courses that Pat has, and you're going to see all the podcasts that Pat has and, and uh, if you go over to patflynn.com, you'll see the companies that he advises and the the uh, philanthropy that he does. So your 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 platform keeps expanding and expanding. How do you decide when to expand and how to expand? Or even if expansion is something you want to do. Right. Right. I have a lot of friends who have very, very good businesses on paper, a lot of employees, angel funding, millions of dollars coming in, and they're absolutely miserable, which is crazy because as especially an entrepreneur, you get to design whatever you want to design. And a person designed something that makes them unhappy. And this is why I think, and this is if you read my, if you read my book, Will It Fly, which is about validating and testing your business ideas, the first three chapters are not even about your business idea. They're all about you and what makes you you, and what lights you up, and how to make sure that you can create essentially rules for life for you, such that if there's an opportunity and it doesn't align with those self-imposed rules or your goals or what have you, then it's an easy way to say no. And that's something that gets us into trouble all the time is saying yes too much. I think a lot of us can relate to that. Um, and learning when to say no and having filters literally like on a piece of paper, like, oh, does this fit these uh, parameters? No. Okay. Then I'm going to say no to that opportunity. Now it's easier to say no. And that's very hard, especially with FOMO and often feeling like, you know, this might be the only opportunity, but as, um, I think it was, uh, Richard Branson said, um, business opportunities are like buses. Uh, as soon as one leaves, another one is going to come. Um, but understanding whether or not you need to expand is important first. Cause I think a lot of us automate to, well, we just need to grow to grow. If we're not growing, we're failing. And I think that's that's incorrect. Um, and so that's number one. 
Number two, should you choose to want to grow, then we need to make sure we pick lanes because you can grow. Imagine you're this entity and you want to grow in all different kinds of ways. So you grow this way and you grow this way and you grow this way and you grow this way. Well, you've just ended up in the same place because all that energy is just getting sort of moved around and then you end up expending energy and you're just ending up in the same spot. So I think understanding, yes, growth is important, but how might you want to grow? And then looking for examples of others who've done it. Whenever I try to learn something new, for example, when I was, uh, I had a goal to run a triathlon or to run, swim and bike a triathlon at one point. So I could have, I could have just, trained myself, I could have, yeah, watched YouTube videos of how to do that. But I wanted to make sure that number one, I did it well. And also I was safe doing it. So I hired a coach. And these people have already run triathlons. They've already made all the mistakes. They already know what to look out for. And they can guide me. And even though yes, in many cases, those things maybe have an upfront cost, it's an investment into saving time. It's investment into my own safety in this case. And in many cases, I think that when you want to grow, Find somebody who has grown to that level that you want to grow to and try to have a conversation with them. Take them out to coffee, provide value to them in some way, get involved in their group discussions or in their communities so that you can understand more about, well, what's it really like there? Because you might find that you don't want to be there once you find out exactly. It's so amazingly cr crazy how we'll spend more time uh, reading Amazon reviews about a product that we're going to buy than making life decisions, like what college to go to, or how we want to grow our business, right? So I think that it's really important to find somebody who is an example who can help you there. And if, if, if they do portray a life that you like and, and that you want, then cool. How did you get there? What were the mistakes that you made along the way? How, you know, the, the, this kind of mentorship uh, can, can, can really fast forward your success and help you grow, not just quickly or more quickly, but help you grow in the right way or in the right direction at least. Uh, I, I think that's so important. We we often see, you know, I, I can look at a Pat Flynn, right? Oh, I, you know, I want to I want to get to where Pat is. I want to do what Pat does. Maybe maybe it's just a small piece of that on on the YouTube channel or something like that, without really understanding the journey. You know, the the whole idea of the uh, uh, the ten year the overnight success ten years in the making. Oh, yes, <laughs> right. this guy. I'm not saying Pat Flynn is because we know you've been you've been at it since 2008. Uh, but we see we see that sometimes. We go, oh, this this person's an overnight success. I want to do that. Yeah. Well, they've usually been, the they've overnight successes. There's a lot more underneath the surface, right? We all yeah. I think we all know that. Um, at the same time, this comparison game that we play, us versus them, is a very dangerous game. I think uh, Jordan Peterson wrote in the 12 Rules of Life, one of those rules to live by is to not compare yourself to others, but to compare yourself to yourself, right? And that's that's the answer. How are you different than, how are you improved? How have you incrementally improved since last week, since last month, since last year on the business plan and you personally? And, 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 and I think that that's so key because especially in this day and age where you can pick up one of these guys and just look on Instagram and go, wow, that person's perfect, or wow, look at how quickly they grew, when you are literally seeing a frame in a person's life that they chose to share versus the full story. Uh, and this is why my recommendation earlier of finding somebody, not just like following them, but really immersing yourself in their world and understanding how they live and trying to get in a conversation with them, you, you understand the full sort of compass at that point versus just that fraction or that moment in time. Uh, but it's very difficult. I, I, I think it's also hard because while we should not compare ourselves to others, it's important to get inspired by others. It's, I think it's important to get motivated and have some direction from others. Uh, and so we have to be very careful how we balance that line of motivation, inspiration, and just like feeling down because we're not getting results like, our, like, like another person is. But we're all, we're all on complete different timelines. You are not them. They are not you. You know different people. You've had different experiences. You've had a different set of circumstances leading you to this point. So the only person you know about well enough, as Jordan Peterson says, to do a true comparison is you. <laughs> so so use that to your advantage, and 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 try to make those incremental uh, improvements over time. Yeah, yeah, and and back to your James Clear one percent every day. You know, am I one percent better today than I was yesterday? Um, I think that's uh, I think that's super important. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I didn't do it today. I didn't, I didn't get the 1% better today, but anyway, we have this question fine. that 
There are lots of people asking questions along these same lines, like how many hours a week do you work? Did you get more sleep sure. when you were working in architecture or now? People, I guess, want to know <laughs> how hard you're working. Yeah. Uh, so every every week and every day is actually different. And, and, and that's uh, both exciting and also scary at the same time. As, as an entrepreneur, um, it's very important to still, despite not having a nine to five anymore, still create boundaries around your work. If that does not happen, you will have work bleed into moments of your life that you shouldn't have it bleeding into. Uh, and there were times where it was bleeding into dinner, right? And I'm on my phone and I'm answering emails or, you know, doing things or playtime with the kids, only being 50% available mentally, even though I'm 100% physically available. Uh, we don't want that to happen. So time boundaries, very important. I use my calendar quite often to help me understand when I should be doing what and what I should be focusing on. And that actually includes family time. I actually have family time in the calendar because when I have it in there and I honor my calendar in that way, um, I can make sure nothing else bleeds into that time, you know, and that's, that's very important to me. Uh, a little bit more difficult when you have super little ones and like, you know, you don't know when exactly they're going to wake up or go to sleep. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult in that way. And, and I have my wife to thank for support uh, a lot for most of how I'm able to do what I'm able to do. So I want to make sure she gets a shout out as well. Um, and then there are moments where I might be, for example, launching something. So Last week, I filmed a brand new course about creating online courses, a little meta, um, but that'll be launched in October. And so last week, it was a big work week for me where uh, two days in a row, I filmed for 10 hours each day. That's a lot. It took a lot out of me, but I planned for it. And then we knew this was coming. And then the later half of the week was a little off. And this week, we're implementing and putting that course together. And it's going to be launched next month. And then after that, all the work would have been done. Now the emails are already written. The sales are already going to come in and, and that work was done up front. And now I have an asset that I didn't have before that will be something that could generate an income daily for years to come. And I'm willing to put in that time and investment up front in order to make these things happen and become more passive later. Um, it, it, it's kind of weird how that works. That was a hard thing for me to learn, which was, you know, oh, I'm putting in a ton of time now and I'm not getting paid for it. Well, there's, it feels risky. Um, but also there's a lot more upside possibility as well. You have a glass ceiling when you work at a, a, a at a business um, for somebody else typically, and the, there is no ceiling when you're working for yourself other than your own energy levels, which is something really important to think about. And then that gets into delegation and hiring and all the other stuff. Uh, somebody had asked, how much do I sleep? Um, I found that six and a half hours is my optimal sleep time. And that came, again, through experimentation and trying to understand how to best optimize for highest uh, levels of energy, but also largest amounts of time for other things. Um, I think Elon Musk sleeps six hours a day. There were times, however, where I was uh, surviving on three to four hours of sleep to get things done. Um, that's not good. And, and as I've gotten older, I've, I've found that to be just completely counter, you know, the purpose of, of what I'm trying to do. Um, but I do get sleep. How many hours a week do I work again? It changes. Some hours I'm, some weeks I'm working. Like I said, last week was a big week with the the, the filming and all that stuff, and and getting ahead on the podcast. Probably a sixty hour week, but then at any moment in time, I could take two, three, four, five, six weeks off, and the business will continue to run. And I, I, and and having the team and then the systems in place, that it's not pass, it's not passive income in that it's set and forget forever. There, there's no such thing unless you're talking residuals from, you know, movies you've starred in or something like that, uh, or royalties from perhaps books. But even then you still need to manage and market and do those things to, to, to keep those things going. Um, but what this is about is about flexibility in time, uh, especially, and having the option to, if I'm just not feeling it this week to record my podcast, because I batch recorded a whole bunch last week, you know what, I'm going to take a break today. I'm just going to go fishing today. I just, my head wants to be in the water catching, catching trout and bass right now. And I can go and do that. The cool thing is nobody else is on the lake because it's not the weekend. I can just go in midweek and that just having, I don't do that every week, but having the option to do that or the, uh, the, the ability or the flexibility to do that, that's freedom to me. The, the ability to do what you want, when you want with whoever you want, um, is, is really what this is for in my opinion, right? So when, when you started with, uh, green exam Academy, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're, you had been laid off, you're on your own basically at that point, but now, you, you know, you mentioned a minute ago, you've got a, you've got a team. 
when what was the tipping point? What was the thing that made you to to decide, hey, I need whether it's a VA or or whatever mm-hmm. that first team member was, where did you when was that point? How did you decide now is the time I need to do this? There are a few moments in time that I can describe that really are impactful with how I've been able to then build my team. So the first one was actually quite quick after I started the architecture website. So I had this exam guide, right? It was all written. It was an ebook. Um, and again, I purposefully did not make it a physical book because I was very much influenced by Tim Ferriss at the time. who was like, work smart, not hard kind of thing. And so it was much easier to deliver an ebook and have it automatically emailed to somebody immediately after purchase than having to go to the post office to print, thing, or print things out, post office returns, like all that kind of stuff, right? So, so this is the way I was designing how I wanted my business to help me and not the other way around. Well, I had an idea from a friend of mine who said, hey, you should create an audio version of that study guide. Like, I think a lot of people would love to listen while on a commute and all that stuff. And that, that made complete sense to me. And so I reached out to my audience first to validate this. And I said, hey, would you, if one was available, purchase an audio version of this book? And I, everybody, it was an astounding yes, right? So I had some verbal validation. So I went to work. I bought a Logitech microphone from uh, Best Buy. The Circuit City around then? No, I think that had already died. Anyway, uh, kind of dating myself a little bit. But Best Buy, I, went, I got a Logitech headset, fairly cheap, and I started recording the book. And after two and a half days, I listened to it, and it was absolute crap. It was, I, would not, I would not be happy selling this, and it would just not uphold the standards that I held for the kind of stuff that I wanted to do. Now, I could have probably still sold it, and it would have been potentially helpful, but I, 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 I wanted to have it be professional. I mean, these are professionals that I'm selling to. I want it to be professional. So then I went back to my mastermind group that I was a part of who, who I was sharing this process with uh, inside of Internet Business Mastery, in fact. And I said, hey, guys, this audiobook idea is probably not going to work. I, I just can't record the audiobook. I tried it, and it, it didn't work. And everybody was like, you tried to record this yourself? Really? Like, <laughs> Pat, Pat, Pat. Oh, Pat. There are people out there who you can hire right now to do that for you. And I was like, really? Where? And they're like, oh, go to elance.com. And there's Elance and Odesk were were the ones back in the day. Those have since combined to become Upwork. There's also Fiverr and all these other places where people have specialty skills who can help you fill in the specialty skills that you don't have. And I was just blown away by that. And so I went on Elance at the time. And it was one of those places where you could post a job and then different people who can support you with that will say, oh, I'll do it for this much. I'll do it for this much. I'll do it for this much. And um, there was a whole bunch of people coming in and the price was $800. One was like $4,000 was the higher one. And there were a bunch of people who were doing it for a low amount, but their, their stuff was not great, great quality. So I ended up uh, with somebody who I paid $1,200 for. And I, was, I had never paid $1,200 for anything in my life, not rent or nothing at that time. Uh, and I said, wow, this is crazy. Like I could do this myself. I could practice. I could get a little bit better. I could maybe get a better microphone. Maybe the microphone's the answer. Maybe I just didn't have the right tools, but I said, you know what? This is an investment in my business. And if I just sell, you know, if I just sell, you know, maybe 30 of these, it will make up for the cost. So, okay. So a couple weeks later, a woman voices by Trish was her name. And she created this thing and it was 70 mp3 files that i put into a package that then got delivered for people uh so they could a person could buy the audiobook alone they could buy the ebook alone or for 44.95 you could buy both 95 percent of people bought both from that point forward and it took a day and a half to make up for that cost just a day and a half wow. and it just that was my first experience with like whoa i can get returns on things like that i invest in that's pretty <laughs> crazy uh which i had never done before uh, fast forward to 2014, I had a podcast going, a uh, weekly podcast. I had a, a, a business, a speaking career. I had uh, books that were available, and I had an idea for another show, another podcast. But there was literally no way that I was going to be able to do it myself unless I sacrificed time somewhere. And the truth is, when you say yes to something, you're also saying no to something else, right? And that could be used for good, or that could be used for bad. If I said yes to this new podcast, I would have said no to other parts of my business, maybe family time or my own mental health and even physical health. A lot of people have been burned out by overproduction. And so that was the point at which I realized, wow, I need, I need some help. So I'm going to hire somebody. I'm going to hire a podcast editor to help me create this new show. And when I saw how quickly she did things and how much better she did things than I could, I said, okay, can you help me 
edit my other show too? And then can you also help me with this as well? And can you help me with this too? <laughs> and I just got like six to eight hours back of my time every single week as a result of hiring her. And um, I've just been on this hiring stint since with bigger and bigger projects. And I'm at a point now where I'm not just hiring support. I'm hiring other leaders. So I have a, a chief operating officer who helps manage a lot of the people related things in the business so that I can stay focused on the creative, right? There's this dichotomy of a, a visionary in a business and an integrator. And most great businesses have two people at the helm of each of those things, a visionary who has big ideas, who can think bigger. And then the integrator who goes, it's basically the architect and the engineer, if you want to think about it that way, right? Because I'm thinking about all the times my integrator, Matt, says, no, 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 we can't do that. Or we don't have the budget for that. And that's kind of what an engineer might say in a project where you want to design this thing, right? I'm having flash like PTSD on, on certain conversations I've had with engineers. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, now the team, like the team feels like the business is also theirs. And so they step up to bat when they need to. And and we're, we're able to scale and grow, which is something I choose to do uh, even bigger and help more people in this way. And, and I think that's, you know, back, we've almost come full circle at this point. You know, you're focused on building community, which is what we're focused on here at Entree Architect, certainly. And context and clarity is, is a community. Um, so how, you know, you, you've, you've been at it, right? You've been at it since 2008. We've mm -hmm. got a lot of architects, um, who are wondering, okay, well, what's this mean? I mentioned earlier when, before we, uh, hit start that we talked to Seth Godin, Seth Godin talked about building community. A number of people that we've talked to in context and clarity talked about building community. This seems to be this common theme. So yeah. Oh, yeah. with um, with someone, an architect that's in, I'm in Indianapolis. So let's just say in Indianapolis, Indiana, that doesn't have a community that doesn't even know what building a community would mean for them. Where do they start? How does, how do you, how do you get something like this off the ground? Well, let's, let's think of what a community is, and then we'll talk about how to build in that community. And then we'll talk about how to engage with that community and get people to sort of step up because a community is not one person talking to a whole bunch of people. That is not community. Right. And a lot right. of people who have a social channel, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, who are just sharing things and they, they still might be valuable things that you're sharing. That's not community. Community is also not those people talking to you. What community really is, is those people being able to find and talk to each other. And that's the beauty of, of what we have here, because not only are we connecting with the community right now, but they're able to connect with each other. And you have the clubhouse and all these interaction uh, moments of interaction. And that's really neat. And that's what anybody can do. An architect can do that. If I had an architecture firm today, that'd be pretty cool, because that's something I had always wanted. And, and that was my goal before, which would be really neat, like the new Frank Gehry or Lynn Gehry or whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> Anyway, Glenn Gary, <laughs> uh, Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. the yeah. building uh, Flugenheims and Guggenheims and Flynn. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> uh, so if I had an architecture firm today, I would know that I would want to know people. I, I would want to make people feel like they're involved with my business, right? That's when you get people involved, they then feel invested. So how might I get people involved? Uh, well, in the, in the local community. I might want to have the ability to crowdsource, perhaps. Uh, and it, again, it depends on the projects. And there's so many layers to this, right? Like, who are the decision makers? What's the funding? And, and all these things. But anyway, if there was a way to involve communities in decisions that I'm making and get them to understand the process, and 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 as Nathan Berry, the founder of ConvertKit, says, you know, work in public, right? That's that's a huge secret to building community. Work in public, which means share your process, talk about what's going on and why you're making certain decisions. And, you know, we only wish people in this world were more open with their process so we could all understand them better and not just get upset at certain things. Or, uh, you know, we, we can have something now to root for and rally behind because we see the process. Um, th th like anybody, th this is why vlogs were so popular. And I'm not saying as an architect, you need to create a vlog, but a, a video sort of blog, if you will, on YouTube that shares the behind the scenes and the how you do what you do. Like imagine 
two architects that a client can choose from. And one architect is very closed in, very professional, but you know they, they don't really talk about much outside of the clients that they then hire, and it's all mostly interrelational in there. Versus an architect who has a personality because they're out there in the community talking to people, and other people have started talking about them. Imagine a, an architecture firm that has, I'm just going to go left field here, crazy, a TikTok. And on this TikTok channel, this architect shares how they go from idea to building and all the stuff in between that needs to happen to help me go, wow, that's the process. And then if I'm ever in need or ever, ever I know anybody in need of an architect, which one do you think I'm going to promote? Even if I don't work for one, I will still at least know about them and hear about them. This is how people who have pest control companies are crushing it on TikTok right now because guess what they're doing? I mean, they have the added benefit of showing really disgusting things and people are like, you know, gravitate towards those kinds of things sometimes. Um, but, you know- <laughs> I have not they, seen that. They're sharing the process of, you know, they'll tear open a wall and they'll show just an infestation. And of course those things kind of go viral and people go, whoa, and then, at, you know, they, they're wearing their badge and then, you know, there's a link in the description for where to go get services. But those companies are exploding just simply because they're showing up and showing their process, right? And I think that a lot of times we feel, oh, but our process is proprietary. That's the secret. No, it's not. In fact, that should be open so that people will go, ah, that's how you do it? Well, help me now. I will hire you because now there's no secrets, right? So opening up can be a really great way to do that. I think that bringing your clients together. Imagine... Like if, if I had an architecture firm and I have I had clients, I would offer, you know, an ability for flying out those clients to all meet each other and providing a space for them to connect with each other. Because again, when you create a space for your people to connect with each other, that only can heighten your brand. So I would I would pay for and, and, and have a little bit of my budget available to wine and dine my clients and just say, thank you for being clients. You're awesome. Here's what's going on next. And not even ask for anything, right? Don't ask for anything. Just serve them and they will serve you. And the cool thing about that is you could, um, you know, share those moments. You're likely going to get some amazing testimonials from real people that you can then share on, on the web and on, on your social accounts. Uh, and you're more likely to be gravitated toward because you have a personality in the space of architecture. And that's one thing that I saw was missing in the space of architecture when I was in it was that there was no personality in many of these things. You look at these websites and they all literally look like the same flash website that had a really cool close-up of a beam. And it's like, how does that represent your company? <laughs> it's a cool picture <laughs> of a beam. Cool picture. But like, what, is, what does that even mean? Who are you, right? And, and I think that's the beauty of social and stepping up into social is that you, you get to define who you are. And here's the thing about business, and this is the secret. People connect with other people. They don't connect with a logo. They don't connect with the beam. They don't connect with the process of what you do. They connect with the people who are behind those things. Um, so anyway, I don't know if mm. I'm even on the same question that, that was originally asked, but um, yeah. Yep. No, you definitely are. And just to follow up with that, um, Chris wanted to know, um, Chris Novelli wanted to know, what questions can we ask the audience to get ah. them to engage? Because sometimes they don't respond. This is great. So first of all, we need to help them, help our communities understand they have a safe place to engage. Right? If they feel like at any moment, any answer they could share would be something that could put them under a, a, a spotlight that they don't want, well, then they're not going to share anything, right? This is really important for our community at SPI Pro. We, we pitch it as such. This is a safe space for you as an entrepreneur to share what's maybe not going right and getting help from other people who have gone through those things before you. So number one, creating that safe space is, is number one. Number two, training, if you will, your audience right from onboarding. The moment a person comes into your community, you want to be able to answer the question, okay, now what? So they sign into your community, they buy into it, or they sign up on Facebook, whatever, LinkedIn. Okay, now what? Okay, now go introduce yourself into the community. Okay, now what? Now do this, now do this. Um, and then making sure that a person understands that when they comment, their comment will be seen. Nobody's going to comment if all the other comments that have been sort of shared before are just kind of ghost town, or there you get like two likes and that's it. When people see that there are, is engaging conversation happening, there will be more engaging conversation happening, right? 
uh, nobody wants to be first either. So if you are asking people to do something, lead by example. If you want to challenge your community to create a 30 second video to help pitch their thing, well, you create a 30 second video first to pitch your thing and say, okay, I'll go first. Okay, who's next? What an amazing way to not be to, to have people go, okay, well, you did it first before me. I'm not, I won't have to be as embarrassed or whatever. And, and then they can, and they can go. And then uh, here's a great, more tactical uh, strategy, if you will. So a lot of times we try to engage our community by just asking questions, right? And asking questions are great. You, you'll get people to answer, but people are more inclined to answer when you are looking for an answer. What I mean by that is it's the difference between, you know, just asking a regular question and then asking a question that has a true definite answer that you know the answer to. You're just allowing your audience to step up and, and share their version of that answer. And, and there's a very specific case where we were speaking, or I, I spoke with a guy named Steve Spangler. He's a scientist. He has an amazing YouTube channel and he creates really cool science experiments for kids and adults alike to learn from. And when he started on YouTube really early on, like 2006 and 2007, he was one of the first you know, creators there. Uh, he created videos where he would do an experiment and then he would share what happened just as any uh, good educator would. Uh, like he would suck in air from a balloon and his voice would be really low. And he said, well, this is because it's a sulfur hexafluoride. It's denser than uh, air. And that's why your voice is lower. Yay. Leave a comment, right? Like that was the call to action. Leave a comment. Or what do you think? Le leave a comment below. And he would get the normal comments that you would get. Cool. Awesome. First, you know, cool. Uh, but then he changed it up. Then he did the experiment in the video, left out the answer, and said, what do you think happened here? I'll share the result next week. Or I will highlight the best answer next week. And so now there's, mo there's actually incentive for a person to go because now they have a platform to potentially get recognized on, which they never had before. So when you ask a question that has a specific answer, and then you can even you know, get your audience to get it. Like, here's what happened to Steve. There were thousands of comments coming in, all fighting to try to make the best answer. People pulling out their physics books and their textbooks, trying to, trying to come up with the best answer. And it, there was so much engagement that YouTube reached out to Steve and said, hey, we want you to be one of the first to create one of our first YouTube originals. And this was back in 2008. And that all happened because of the engagement and because he gave people permission to share something in a way that they could potentially be recognized. Right. And they give him a safe space to do that. Awesome. That this is great. And we're, we're headed very, very close to the top of the hour here. And, uh, uh I know we've got to wrap this up, which seems like a real shame because this is a fantastic conversation. Um, I do want to point out, I, I was scrolling and trying to find whose comment this was, but, but, uh, this I didn't find it. Oh. Someone said a, a, a few minutes ago that they showed up for their uh, their daily inspiration and they are not disappointed. So yeah, that uh, was Audrey, Pat, I think. That was, all right, Audrey, Thank welcome. You, Audrey. Uh, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Good morning, Audrey from Australia. Glad that uh, yeah. glad you're joining us, um, Pat. It, it's it's been fantastic. When as we wrap this up. Again, you know, there's a lot of architects that uh, that are tuned in right now. Uh, do you have one piece of advice for somebody uh, that is a small firm architect that's just, you know, they're they're looking, they're looking into 2022 and 2023, and what do you think? Um, it may be about architecture, and it may not be about architecture, but mm -hmm. what's the future of success in in uh, small business in the small business world? Do you think? Well, first of all, thank you for having me and, and everybody, all the wonderful comments. I wish I could stay to answer more questions. Um, and perhaps that means we'll need a part two at some point. We'll, we'll see. Mm. I think that if I were to answer that question, you know, the, we talked about community. Again, I think community is going to be a, a big part of this or, or, or creating some sort of content that brings personality to your brand, right? That uh, brings the people side of it out. People connect with other people. It's not B to B, not B to C. It's P to P, person to person. But I also want to recognize that when, and, and maybe this is just from my own experience, when I was working in architecture, uh, in an architecture firm, um, you know, I didn't really get recognized or even have an opportunity to, to grow faster because I had that definite capability. And I think it's now shown after I've left architecture. However, when I was an architect, I was definitely, I had a, I had a governor on me. Like 
you know, when you try to go really fast in an electric vehicle, like a, not a Tesla, cause that was really fast, but like a, like a golf cart, you can't go that fast because there's something in there that's stopping you because it's saying, no, this is not safe. And I think a lot of us who are maybe more managerial are putting a lot of governors on, on our, on our people who, which actually might work against us because some of those people could be incredibly fast and, and really efficient at what they do. And so one thing that I've done on my team is I've given more responsibility to people on my team. I've given them more ownership of things in a way such that they are actually now more motivated than they were before, more motivated than ever, because now they own that piece, quote unquote, own, not like own share of the company, but that's what they're responsible for. And when we give them an opportunity to share the progress they've made, they get to step up, they get an opportunity to have a little bit of a say and show off what they've done. I've gotten so much production out of the team in a way that I would have never thought. And they feel proud of it too. They feel like this company is also there and they're, they're here for a bigger mission than just supporting Pat Flynn. Um, and, and I think that's really great. So you can empower your uh, people to do some amazing things that you probably didn't even think they could do. And you can get a lot more output from that and have a, an amazing culture within your business too. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you for that advice. Uh, and mm-hmm. thank you for this conversation. It's been a fantastic conversation. We appreciate you joining us and, and everything that you're doing for your community and, and that you're putting out there in the world. It's, it's uh, much appreciated. Uh, for those of you who are out there in our audience, uh, we appreciate all of you. And we say this every week, but uh, thank you for making context and clarity thing, because if it weren't for you, we'd not be having this conversation with Pat Flynn right now. So uh, we appreciate you uh, building this community around us. For those of you on the podcast, hey, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Catherine and I are going to jump off here in just a minute, and we're going to record context and clarity backstage with a mystery guest where we're going to break down this conversation with Pat. We're going to talk about our biggest takeaways and how we're going to apply them to our businesses and our world. So you've got to tune in. You've got to listen in on Tuesday to find out who that special guest is and get our takeaways. And of course, we'll be back again tomorrow. Same bat time, same bat channel, 4 p.m. Eastern inside the Entree Architect Community Facebook group for our mystery uh, member spotlight tomorrow. It's uh, it's our every other Friday special. Who will it be? You've got to show up and guess, see if you can figure out who that member is. And then as we look forward to next week, our special guest next week on Context and Clarity Live will be Angela Donahoe. She's the Chief Executive Vision Officer at Donahoe. (laughs) That's just what I was thinking, Pat. That was awesome. The timing was impeccable. Uh, Angela's with the Donahoe Group. She's also a facilitator of one of the uh, the uh, Entree Architect Masterminds. Uh, it's the legacy firm Mastermind. So we're going to talk to Angela about being uh, a leader in a generational organization or multi-generational organization. So look forward to that. Uh, again, Pat, thanks a lot for joining us. This has Thank been you. Um, a really great hour. Appreciate you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, everybody. Oh, yeah. See it you was soon. great. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. All right, everybody out there. I hope that uh, we'll see you around somewhere sometime soon.